you were, um, and, and how did you run into Richard Rainwater and how did you become associated with him? Because, you know, I worked for the Bass family, Robert Bass Land, for three years and uh, I have nothing but high regard for Mr. Rainwater. He was such a special guy, really intelligent, but really quality person. Amazing man. I miss him every day. And I, Richard was like a father, like a brother, and a partner, kind of all wrapped into one. And it was a very interesting relationship we had. And for some reason, I was working at KPN, what was Pete Marwick back then, KPMG now, in the Fort Worth office. The Fort Worth office was a very important office of the firm because it had the Bass Brothers right. account. And so they were very active because of Richard as chief investment officer. And I actually worked out with him in the afternoons, and one day he said, hey, I need somebody full-time, basically in my office, helping me from the firm. And so I oh my God, got annoyed awesome. in that position. So did you interface with him in your position, at, in your job? Yeah, or did, yeah. For, as, well, as well as working out with him? Yeah, for two, three years, okay. and then he left the Basses in 86. Right. He called me, and he said, John, I want you to come join me, and I was... I mean, it was lightning in a bottle. That was, right. the, that was what I'd been waiting for my entire career. Right. And so I said, done. You know, I didn't call home and I just, <laughs> we're done. We're good. You knew that was a good deal. I didn't even know what I was going to make. It didn't matter. It didn't matter, right. So I went to work for Richard in June of 87. So. And helped start Rainwater Inc. Right. And so, like, it seems my view of you is you're a contrarian. I, I kind of, th I think you make really good moves when everybody's hiding under their desk. And I also think um, you've got a calculated high risk tolerance. Would you agree with me on that? It, partly. Okay. Um, I'm definitely a contrarian and I learned that. From him. From right? an incredible guy uh, who was one of the best contrarians of them all. And I am, but in terms of taking risk, you know, yes, I take what I think people perceive as a lot of risk, but in my view, like investing in oil and gas in 2015 in a big way, a lot of people think you're crazy, you're going to lose your ass. I underwrite the heck out of that. I'm a data junkie. I look at lots of information. I don't always get it right, right. but I underwrote that big investment in energy in 2015 by saying it's just way oversold. We're not, repl I can go on and on about the thesis. Right. But in my mind, I don't take big risks. I think the perception is I might. I also take big concentrated, I make big concentrated investments. I don't like to do a lot of really small things. It's just, yeah. I, I don't, it's not meaningful. Richard and I one time actually had, we hired a firm to come in and audit our results after we had been together for about eight years. And what we found is that 80% of the profits came out of 20% of the investments. Always. And all these little things were big distractions. Yep. Um, to just, just one quick story. So I started in June of 87. For those history buffs, many of you are too young for this, but in October of 87, we had what was called Black Monday. Yeah, of Massive sell-off in the stock market. Richard called me into his office, and understand, you know, I'm 32 years old. I don't have a nickel. You don't make, you know, I didn't make any money in public right. accounting. Right. He called me into his office and he said, um, he said, hey, I'm gonna get somebody on the phone and I'm gonna get, um, I just want you to listen in on this because I, I, I want you to do something. So he gets this partner on the phone that was uh, uh, a guy that had been with Drexel Burnham and he was running a fund that was uh, still with, in partnership with the Bass family. And he said, uh, this guy's name was Dort. He said, hey, Dort, um, I got this young kid in my office. I want you to wire him $50 million. This is the, the market's collapsed, okay? I want you to wire him $50 million. John, I want you to put the $50 million to work in the market. And I was With like, no guidance? He just said zero. Me. Zero. So, God, I love that guy. In hindsight, you know, first of all, I was scared out of my mind. Yeah, okay? it's I mean, awesome, though. Palms were sweaty. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I would love to think that Richard thought I was some boy genius 
and I wasn't going to screw it up. The reality was Richard was the ultimate contrarian, and he knew the market was so oversold right. that this young kid is not going to goof this up. He could yeah. basically buy anything, yeah. and it's going to go back up. Yeah. And now, I sweated for a month or more you know, while I selected stocks and went in carefully, and I put the $50 million to work, and you know, look, it worked out well, but again, it was all timing. Right. It wasn't that I was any. And when you did that, did you take big positions in what you bought or like? Big. Yeah. Like, I mean, you've got 50 million. Did you buy? I bought 30? Five, about five names. Right. So big bets. Yeah. Right. Right. But I knew them intensely. Right. Right. I, I do think people look at like, I feel the same way about me. I like, I, I'm okay with risk because I've studied it and I'm comfortable that there's great opportunity for the risk, right? Not always right either, but it, people will look at what you're doing, other people, and question it, and I get it. But I, I do think that risk is based on your gut, right? Or, or your, your homework going in. So before I get to the good stuff, what, give me a bad deal. What's your biggest mistake? Uh, probably the biggest mistake is a year or two after um, this, the, the Black Monday, uh, we had a couple of executives. By the way, every day at Richard's office was like a pickup basketball game. Yeah. It was just a who's who yeah. coming in the door, and it was crazy. Yeah. And it was just a handful of us. Yeah. Um, and Richard said, hey, John, you need to take this meeting. So I go into this meeting, a couple of executives from Phillips Van Heusen that you know, made the shirts. Yes. And they said, hey, we've got the ability to buy a subsidiary of this public company, and we can buy it, we think, really cheap. We need the money to do that. So I go through the math, and I you know, look at the deal, and end up saying, this is actually pretty interesting. You know, back these two guys have been running the business. And so we do it, but I made a deal with them because, again, I hadn't made a big lick yet. You know, so I'm... Yeah. I'm working, you know, I've got a little money, but not a lot, so I'm right. trying to find things where my money goes a long way, because Richard, the only way I got, really got paid was investing alongside of, mm -hmm. in our deals. So I over-engineered it. I told the guys, I said, look, how much money do you have to put up? They told me, I said, okay, well, all that's gotta go in. We'll put up, we'll match that, but if I'm able to get financing on this, our money gets paid down first. Well, I got financing so that was so incredible, we didn't need to put up any money. So I went to Richard and I said, Richard, I got this deal and we're gonna own you know, half this company and we're not gonna have to put up any money and the executive is gonna put up all the equity. And he's like, what, how'd you do that? I said, well, I got financing and you know, here's, here's the way the math works. And he said, that's incredible. So, you know, I hand him his share of the stock. I've got my share. That was a bad construct. I over-engineered that deal. And it blew up later because us as the capital investors and the management team were not unified. We had different starting points. Yep. And it just ended up being a big, big problem. Mm -hmm. And I, so I learned a lot. Yeah. So do you, one of the things I find is a bad deal with a good guy is going to work out. A great deal with a bad guy, you're toast. I really do think people um, are, the, are kind of the biggest problem in a deal that goes sideways. Would you agree with that? Oh, no, no question. Yeah. So no question. Talk, let's talk about creating Crescent. I mean... Um, was Richard involved in Crescent, or did you, is that when you left Richard? No, Richard, um, we were in the office, and we routinely had lunch together, and I went into lunch and said, hey, Richard, I've got an idea. There's really nothing interesting to work on. I've been working on oil and gas. I've been managing his money in the stock market. I'd been, we, we did a big hospital deal with Rick Scott, so we, had, we were growing that business. Um, we had taken, uh, uh, you know, a bankrupt drilling company and turned it into what is now Insco, you know, a big offshore drilling company. And so I'd been working on all that. There was really not that much interesting other than the real estate business. And real estate was just in a ditch, disaster, early 90s. Right. Okay. So I said, 
I'd like to take everything off my desk and I'd like to focus on this business plan. And I'd literally written it, written it, written it down on one page of a yellow pad. Real simple, which is what he liked. I walked him through the plan. He goes, I love it. He said, you put up your entire net worth, everything. Which my net worth at the time was, to me, very significant. Sure. But it was probably four or five million dollars. Right, right. And I had to put up all of that. And he said, and he scribbled on the paper, and I would wish I had that piece of paper. He scribbled on there how much he would allocate of his net worth, of his liquidity. Yeah. And so he said, get after it. So that was literally his involvement. So it got launched. Right. And I, you know, I was the first employee, and I started building this company by buying assets by the pound. Right. So I think um, the meltdown in 07, 08, and 09, the crescendo was when you sold your assets. I think you hit the high water mark of that cycle, in my opinion. Because I remember when that happened, and you got a great price for it, and then like eight minutes after you closed, the world was falling apart. Did you see that coming? Did you see the financial markets melting down? Look, I'm, I'm not about to say I was smart enough to see everything coming. Right. But I, what I will say is nothing felt good. Right. Nothing felt right. Right. We were getting offers that made no sense to me on virtually everything in our portfolio. And at this point in time, you know, we got north of a $6 billion company that I built from a yellow pad. Right. And in the boardroom, I have more to lose than anybody in that room. For sure. I got my net worth on the line. Right. And so I'm highly focused on big trends and what's happening. I saw financing that made no sense to me whatsoever. Totally. I saw mezzanine financing. I'm talking about bank financing. I saw mezzanine financing that made no sense. I saw buyouts at prices that made no sense. Equity office had just been sold for a giant number. Crazy number. Crazy number. Um, and we were a complicated business. We had a lot of disparate investments, yep. really interesting investments, but it wasn't just pure office. Right. So there weren't a lot of natural buyers. Morgan Stanley came to me and honestly, they wanted two things. They loved the company, and, but they also wanted our team. We had a great team yeah. and they had this big concept of you know rolling North America up under me and this team and et cetera, et cetera. Well, um, I said, look, I'm, I'm, you're welcome to have the team. I can't discuss any of this with you until after the sale occurs, because I didn't want to be recused from the board meetings. Right. right? So um, we got it done, six and a half billion dollars. It was way over leveraged. I told them it wouldn't work. They put a billion one of equity up, and I said, it, it, you can't run a real estate business on that much leverage. Right. Everything's got to work perfect, and then yeah. we're going into some serious headwinds, in right. my opinion. Right. So, if I've ever, if I've learned one thing, is leverage, if you don't have the cash to pay it down, is bad. It's, it just is. You can't over lever. Because I think when you get into an uncertain market and market, the market gets more difficult, people use leverage to get yield, and I think that's dangerous. So like, were you, so did you go with them when you sold, did you go over to that and then operate? I did, the, the day I after we that. closed, um, I joined forces with them, we negotiated a deal. Um, I did that for about two months and I finally, these were friends of mine too. I mean, yeah. I knew all these, this team at Morgan Stanley and I, I flew up to New York. I said, look, we gotta have dinner. I met with them and I said, guys, I feel like I'm running the post office. You know, you've got 15 people overseeing everything we do. Um, there's a wonderful team of people, many of them are here today, mm -hmm. um, underneath me that can run the business. You don't need me. Yeah. And, you know, let's just tear this agreement up. You don't owe me a nickel. I'm gonna go focus on my family office. And so, that's what we did. Okay, and so, one last thing on that. So when, then when you go back and buy it back, and then I wanna get into Crescent currently, did they come to you? No. Um, Barclays put up the bulk of the debt. Yeah. And they never syndicated that debt. It was about so it was on three point seven billion. Yeah. Yeah. That they held. It had been paid down some. Yeah. And that 
Barclays approached me and said, hey, would you like to buy your old company back? This was in 2000, the spring of 2009. Right. Just sold it in August 2007. Right. And they knew they were going to get the keys back. And I said, I would love to buy it back, but you're not going to like the number. And I said, I don't even know how to value anything right now. Because, I mean, the world was in it's meltdown. It's a free yeah. Totally. So we, it's a long story, but the short version is by fall, we ultimately negotiated a deal to buy it back in partnership with Barclays. And it was the single best real estate deal I've ever done. Totally. Um, but it was right place, right time, all about timing and structure, a good structure. So the sale had to be the single best sale in real estate. Maybe you have other industries you've done that well at, but that had to be the number one there, right? And then the number oh, one buy after it? I count my blessings every day. You have a the timing of that. in your pocket or what? August 3rd, 2007. Yes, awesome. Okay, so tell me about Crescent today. Well, Crescent today, we've got a great team, about 130 some odd people. Yeah. Um, between assets under management, and buying power, we're call it north of 10 billion. And uh, look, I'm just blessed to have a great team. Yeah. I, you know, I feel like I'm a cheerleader, I serve hot coffee, yeah. pat people on the back. <laughs> um, but no, I, I I love my involvement. Yeah. But I'm I'm chairman. We've got two co CEOs, um, and just you know wonderful development team. And Suzanne Stevens, our CFO, has been with me since 1994. A lot of there's a lot of uh, long term people. That that would be my comment. Is what I I've seen is people come to work for you and they stay with you. It's because you've had a team that. A lot of the same people, and I know all of them, or most of them, and they've stayed together through, through the whole process, which, is, which speaks to, it's got to speak to your culture, right? I mean, I, I think it's a wonderful culture, and it's, we have a lot of uh, youth now in the, you know, amongst the team, and it's, it's great to see. 